Uh, it was very nice of the Financial Times to call my book a cult classic, and I, I'd often heard movies called cult classics, and I often wonder what that means, and I've discovered that what it means is it's something people talk about but don't buy. <laughs> uh, so I'm delighted to be back. My, my life changed in Toronto one day. I went to the, to the ROM. I was here for the weekend. I went to the ROM, and I bought a book that uh, changed my life because uh, I, I fly, I've been flying around, uh, as Brian mentioned, North America for 20 years, providing advice to institutional investors. And I'm a great reader. I'm always reading a book. And uh, I think Americans get quite intimidated by people who read books. And nobody ever spoke to me in, in sort of all those years. And, but anyway, I bought this book at the ROM. And suddenly, I started getting on these airplanes. And Americans kept coming up to me. And they always said the same thing. They said, why are you reading that? And no one ever spoke to me. And then suddenly, five times in every flight, people said, why are you reading that? So my first piece of advice to you uh, is get a copy of that book. If you want to speak to more Americans and find out more about America, buy a copy of that book. They still sell it in the, in the ROM, and it's called The Penguin History of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are two parts to this presentation, and I suspect I may not have time to do the second part. Uh, but that's fine, because I, hopefully you'll find the first part more important. Uh, as Brian also mentioned, I run this course called The Practical History of Financial Markets. We've been doing that for over 10 years, and I'm going to try and give you what we think are some of the propositions which derive from that course as to why equity valuations mean revert. And then, of course, I can do what, it, my, if you like, my day job, which is speculate about which way they're going next. Uh, the second one is 50-50, you know, likely to be wrong. Uh, so let's hope there's more value in the first one. Get this going the right way. George, any idea? I can use that. I can Should use this. Move this one here. What is the IT person? <laughs> <You're> not... Okay. <laughs> why, why we do? Why we get it fixed? Let me tell you what I'm going to. I'm going to put up a chart of the cyclically adjusted PE. It worked before. Which uh, I think you know. Ver I think everybody in this room can close their eyes and see the cyclically adjusted PE. There's barely a day uh, when it's not on the front page of the newspapers. Uh, and I'm going to talk about why it, uh, why it mean reverts. And I'm going to make a case for why I think inflation and changing inflationary, and changing inflationary expectations are the key thing uh, that make equities mean revert. So the first time I saw that chart of the Cape, which is now famous and obviously associated with a Nobel Prize winner, uh, I thought, well, this is wonderful. This makes life very easy. Uh, I can really uh, hope to make a lot of money using this uh, going forward. Uh, but obviously, it's not that easy. Uh, and particularly, I was looking at the bottoms, because clearly you want to buy them when they're cheap. And what you discovered, if you look at the four great bottoms, there's actually quite a big range between, I think, nine and a half times Cape and six times Cape. Uh, and for any of you who've ever bought an equity at nine and a half times and watched it go to six times, well, you probably got fired. So I, I tried to add some value to this. Uh, and the investigation of the book was to look at the four times that equities got cheap. And I read, and to the day, I read every copy of the Wall Street Journal uh, two months before and every copy of the Wall Street Journal two months afterwards, to try and, on four occasions, so that's 16 months of Wall Street Journals, to try and see if we can add some value as to why these things get cheap uh, and why they go back up again. So that, I wrote the book in 2005, and that set me on this journey to try and uh, add some value to why this thing uh, mean reverts. So I'm going to argue that it's changing inflationary expectations, which are key. Uh, but also, I'm going to argue for reflexivity, which you'll know is a famous Soros term, so that equity valuations change behavior of the fundamental underlying corporations. Uh, and that's why it mean reverts. It, it acts as a spigot, for the, or a, a, a spigot to turn on and turn off uh, capital creation. And there's a feedback loop here. And that's why uh, equities mean revert. Also, technology is absolutely key. Uh, the really big changes uh, and the great big beliefs of bull markets are always associated with technology. Uh, it delivers two things that people think are sustainable, higher growth and lower inflation, and they're not. The fundamental error of investors over the last 150 years is to believe that technological breakthrough provides permanent low inflation and higher growth. That's when you get a real bull market, and it is always, so far at least, uh, proven to be wrong. So in terms of looking to the future, I'd argue to you we're facing a, a world of deflation. Uh, but if I'm wrong on that, I think the equity market will go up as long as inflation stays below 4%. So I'm starting with all these propositions, and then I'm going to try and uh, defend them. Uh, so um, and I'll try and talk about why we can have deflation in a fiat currency world. Because I'm often told that we can't have inflation in a fiat currency world. In fact, when we put our course together, 
We had a room with uh, 40 investors in that room and some academics. Uh, and the qualification to be in the room is you had to have 40 years experience. And we simply said to people, what do you know today that you wish you'd known 40 years ago? And we'll build a course around it. And the fund managers in the room requested this focus on inflation, disinflation, and deflation. Uh, but there was a very leading British academic in the room. And he said, well, you've got to teach inflation and you've got to teach disinflation, but there is no point in teaching deflation because we live in a fiat currency system and we will never have deflation. So that was the academic mainstream, clearly at least somewhat questioned by the events uh, of 2009. Uh, but I think it remains incredibly important for equity investors. So there is the mean reversion. As you can see, very cleverly, we've left all the dates off the bottom. Not sure how that happened. Uh, but it begins in uh, 1881. Uh, and runs to the current day, uh, and I can talk you through the tops and bottoms. So when I began to look at the bottoms, what I discovered is it's all associated with deflation. Equities get cheap when you have deflation. Now, I realize you will look at that. Many of you here will have been investors in 1982, and will quite categorically say, well, there was no deflation in 1982. Uh, and I would argue with that very strongly, because what happened in 1982 is America lost all of its bank capital. Uh, almost in an afternoon, it was August, it was July 1982, when the, uh, foreign, uh, the uh, finance secretary of Mexico arrived in Washington, D.C. to explain that Mexico would not be paying its debts. Uh, and there was a cascading effect uh, through other uh, then called LDCs, lesser developed countries, who did the same thing. And certainly the money center banks had no capital had those loans been marked to market. And if the money center had no, bank, uh, no capital, that was certainly going to cause more than a bit of a problem for the regional banks uh, who had a lot of money on deposit with those banks. Uh, and when you read the Wall Street Journal of 1982, at a time when inflation was double digits but falling, uh, the word deflation actually crops up. The biggest definition of deflation would be a period where there's no bank capital. Because in a period where there's no bank capital, banks should not be creating any money. Banks should be contracting their loan books and in the process of contracting their loan books, they should be destroying money. And that has been true in the other great bottoms, uh, 1921, 1932, 1949, uh, and I believe 1982 was also associated with this impending deflation associated with the evaporation of bank capital. There's a much easier way we can talk about bank uh, equity bottoms and deflation, and that is, theoretically at least, and in practice, every time you should buy equities every time Citibank goes bankrupt because it has been bankrupt on all four occasions. Sadly, of course, it also goes bankrupt even outside of great bear market bottoms, uh, but certainly in 1921, it was bankrupt lending money to the, uh, the, the sugar manufacturers of Cuba. In 1932, basically lending people money to its own executives to speculate in its own equities. Uh, in 1949, every bank in America was theoretically bust if government bonds were to find their own level. Uh, 82, lending money overseas, 91, lending money in Texas, and recently lending money everywhere. So Citibank's a pretty good uh, barometer for the banking system, and when Citibank goes bust, it's a good time to consider buying equities. So they're solvent, as far as I'm aware. So how, after, the investigation suggests to me that, that equities get cheap. Why do they get cheap in a deflation? Well, we, we'll just talk briefly about Gordon's dividend discount model. The problem is... If you think of 1929, equities were, were very high and they collapsed rapidly. Now, was that because people's perception of the discount rate changed dramatically? Did people wake up in uh, October 29 saying, oh my goodness, the discount rate is going up? Clearly not, because exactly the reverse happened. The Fed was cutting interest rates very quickly. What completely changed was their perspective on growth, and it changed incredibly rapidly. But there is a third key component of that equation, and it's N. And what happens in a deflation is N shrinks, the number of periods of discounting. For those of us, and it's nearly everybody in this room who lived through the GFC, uh, I don't think any of us probably will forget the day that Jeff Immelt went to the president or to Hank Paulson and explained that the GE was unable to roll over its funding in the commercial paper market, and there were real concerns about their ability to, to have a positive cash flow going forward. Something I think most of us thought would never happen, but did happen. But in that period, what is the N on your discounting period when you get an event like that? And having lived through that period, people were clearly reducing the N and reducing the G for growth to a negative number. And suddenly, yes, equities could trade at incredibly low prices. And that's why deflation is fundamentally bad for equities, because we often call equity an asset. 
uh, and I rebel against the definition of equity as an asset, because uh, equity is the, the thin sliver of hope between assets and liabilities. It's a bundle of assets and liabilities. And the problem with deflation is suddenly that thin sliver of hope gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and we've had a very recent example of that. So deflation, I think, creates the opportunities. Now, the problem with the CAPE is it's like life. Uh, it tells you a lot about the extremes, but perhaps not so much in the middle. So let's talk about the other extremes, uh, which are the highs. And the highs, going back to Gordon's dividend discount model, are associated with uh, a low discount rate and a high growth rate. That's why you get a high valuation. It's not rocket science. But the problem with the real highs is we extrapolate this into the far distant future. We assume that this is not a business cycle. It's a new paradigm or a new economy. I once did a search through the... Uh, through the uh, the newspapers to see who first used the phrase new economy in the late 1990s. And you'd probably be surprised to know that actually, although you associate it with Wall Street, it was uh, Bill Clinton. It was Bill Clinton who first used the word new economy. I think within a week, Alan Greenspan was using the new word new economy. Uh, and if we look at all the tops in this, uh, even back to 1901, you'll find the word new economy keeps cropping up. And the reason is because now suddenly here is this form of technology which can deliver sustainably higher growth at lower levels of inflation. In other words, a low discount rate and a high growth rate, but crucially sustainable because of a technological breakthrough. Now, look at the chart. Uh, this, is, you know, this starts in 1881. Think of the technological changes in the United States of America since 1881. And despite that, really this cape has never been much sustainable above 25. We were talking about, I mean, we've, we're seeing the automobile in there, we're seeing electrification in there, we're seeing the computer in there, we're seeing the internet in there. We're seeing the transform technological transformation of an economy, and yet, despite all of that, we don't really see equities valued uh, at more than 25. And it's because of the fundamental error, I think, in my uh, years of doing this business, what I would say is this. I notice, uh, and I've been mainly on the sell side, that uh, analysts spend 90% of their time forecasting demand and 10% of their time forecasting supply. Uh, that's the fundamental problem uh, with the technology. People spend far too much time looking at this, the, uh, the demand uh, and not enough at the supply. And if you're looking more at the supply, you'd come more to the conclusion that these technological breakthroughs cannot deliver permanently higher growth with permanently uh, lower inflation. And I think that partially explains the high valuation today. Clearly, we live in an age of technical marvels. Uh, many people say it's the like of which we've never seen before, perhaps, but we have seen many uh, major breakthroughs in technology before. Uh, this one, I think, will go the way of all of them. And I think the number is uh, interesting for everybody who invests everywhere in the world. It's often said that we only have this data in great detail for the United States, and therefore, uh, we can't use it. We can't obviously get a current cyclically adjusted PE from most markets. Uh, we can't get this long data series. Uh, but I think there's an important story in here, which is America was an emerging market in 1881. So I'm a, a great uh, bull of uh, India and Indian equities, uh, but I look at the, the high valuation. And people say, well, it's completely justified because it's an emerging market. Well, let's go to America in 1901. The cyclically adjusted PE is 26 and America emerges, it very clearly from 1901 to 1921 uh, is the emergence of the United States of America. What happens to equity valuations? Well, they go from 26 to f uh, below six times. Even though you pick the right market at the right time and you got reasonable returns, you got reasonable returns because of dividends, but the valuation collapsed. Because A, you just paid too much for them, full stop. Uh, I, I don't have to use that quote in this room, I think. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. By 1901, this was pricing in a significant uh, leap forward for America, which did come to pass. And secondly, a great lesson for all emerging market investors. This is a very broad index, the cyclically adjusted PE, and therefore dominated by railroads. So yes, this country emerged. Yes, this country broke through, but that sector certainly did not uh, and was famously nationalized by the Americans briefly in 1917. So I think there is a lesson for emerging market investors here that you should be cautious. For the market as a whole, this does not relate to individual equities, but to markets as a whole, you should be cautious uh, if they begin to trade above 25 times. So if that somewhat explains the extremes, the peaks and the troughs, what about the bit in the middle? Uh, well, if we look at the chart, I'm going to argue to you that equity valuations can fall rapidly uh, 
if the bit that you're wrong on is growth. And it will fall slowly if the bit that you're wrong on is the discount rate. So in 1901 to 1921, the main surprise in that period, at least until the very end, was inflation. Clearly had inflation associated with World War I. Nobody had foreseen just how much inflation there would be. America had lived through a two-decade period of falling prices and price stability, uh, and that came as a great surprise. And the higher discount rates associated with warfare uh, and the inflation and the need to crush that inflation, particularly uh, from 1919, uh, brought the equity market down. Uh, but it's a very slow process. It's a 20-year decline uh, in valuations. And if basically, I would argue, associated with you being wrong on the discount rate, but not the growth rate, because the growth rate was pretty good and robust, uh, but you lost money anyway. And I, th I think the same thing is true for 68 uh, to 82, but then you can see the very dramatic changes in valuation from 29 to 32, uh, from 37 to uh, early 40, uh, 2000 to 2002, uh, and obviously our most recent experience since 2007 to 2009. And on those occasions when they fell rapidly, it's because expectations of growth changed rapidly, not because there was a change on your inflation expectations and your discount rate. So where we stand today, clearly the crucial thing is what is the future? Is it a future with uh, growth uh, and inflation, or is it a future with deflation? Uh, and I would argue that uh, although I'm uh, very concerned to be buying equities at an overvaluation, that the equity market will probably go up if the future for America for the next few years is growth with inflation below 4%. Uh, and I'm going to make an argument that the 4% inflation number is a very important number, uh, and that as long as inflation stays below 4%, uh, the equity market can stay at a very high level unless we get to deflation, which is my view. But if I'm wrong, and if this is a, an economy growing with 4% inflation, equity valuations will stay high as long as inflation uh, does not break out uh, above 4%. Now, people look at the, the chart, and they quite argue that there's two bits to this chart. There's, the, there's life up until 1995, and then there's life after 1995. And all the data after 1995 gives you a completely different picture, and we should just use the post-95 data. It's moved into, if I can quote uh, Irving Fisher, a permanently higher plateau. Uh, and you'll remember Mr. Fisher wasn't particularly accurate in that forecast in 1929. Uh, I disagree, and I disagree for a simple reason. I note that inflation in America did fall below 4% uh, in 1995. It's basically been there ever since. And I'm going to argue, and I'll hopefully show you some charts, that when we get inflation below that level and produce growth, then it does step up, and it does stay at a higher level. But you must believe that inflation will stay within those tram lines, that they'll stay, we'll have a growth period with inflation staying below between 0 and 4%. And that, of course, is possible. And it has been delivered uh, for a prolonged period of time, obviously with a few hiccups associated primarily with deflation. So it's possible that equities stay up there if you think that central bankers can deliver us growth and inflation at zero uh, to 4%. Now, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that that continues, not because central bankers are stupid. Uh, and it's very easy to get up onto a podium and criticize central bankers for being stupid. And we should never do that because we've given them a job which is impossible. And you should never criticize someone from doing a job that's impossible. So it's much more likely that they fail than they succeed, not because they're stupid, but because we've given them uh, an impossible job. Uh, and my favorite quote on central banking uh, goes back to 1810, which is the British Bullion Committee. So Britain had left the gold standard to defeat Napoleon once uh, in 1810. Sadly, we had to come back and defeat him again in 1815. Uh, but the British uh, put together the Bullion Committee to decide whether it should return to the gold standard. And there's a little line in the Bullion Committee report and it says this. It says, no man or body of men could ever estimate the correct amount of circulating media for an economy. And therefore we have to go back to the gold standard. And I think it's as true today as it was then. The gold standard's a political decision. We're never gonna have it again. It's not going to happen. But the idea that any man or today woman could sit in a room and work out the right amount of money for the economy seems to me highly, highly, highly unlikely. Therefore, it will probably end in inflation or deflation. Uh, but if they keep pulling this off and give us growth and inflation below 4%, then this equity valuation will stay up. And if that's your, if that's your view on the world, then we're probably going to stay with very high overvalued equities for a very long period of time.
Uh, I put the, the queue up as well. You'll, you'll know what the queue is, uh, sometimes called Tobin's queue, looking at equities relative to the replacement value of their assets. And I think this is an easier way to, to first of all, they confirm each other, which I think is important. You hear a lot of criticism of the CAPE today, uh, people saying that it's distorted for all sorts of reasons. Uh, this is both measures uh, relative to their own average uh, since 19, 1900. Well, if CAPE is distorted, it is distorted at exactly the same time, in exactly the same way, in exactly the same magnitude as the Q. Now, one's measuring earnings and one's measuring assets. Uh, it seems to me unlikely that you'd take two measures with two different fundamentals that would be distorted by the same magnitude at the same time in the same way. So one of the reasons for putting it up is to suggest that the, despite the criticisms, that we are getting accurate readings uh, from the CAPE. But the other one, I think, is much easier to explain this reflexive issue, uh, which I think uh, for a value audience, I think you sort of know intuitively anyway uh, when you look at the Q. So when I did my book, I looked at the, the actual low for the market, and I discovered an amazing thing. Q is different from CAPE. There's quite a big range in CAPE at the bottom of the market. But for Q, it's been identical. If we assume that there's not much change in the uh, replacement value of assets entry year and just use the low, low point for the Dow Jones Index, it was always uh, within 1%, a 70% discount to replacement value of assets on all four occasions uh, that I looked at. Uh, there's nothing in our business which is that accurate. Uh, and it was surprising, uh, but it happened on four separate occasions. And that's, I think, the beautiful thing about these measures of value. They send, at those extremes, important messages to boards. And there's a very simple message to a board uh, when it sees its equity trading at a 70% discount to replacement value of assets. And the simple message is this, stop put building more assets. Uh, and sometimes for boards, it takes a hell of a big discount to persuade them of that. Uh, but historically, that's what has happened. Stop building more assets. A dollar of cash paid to your shareholders is a dollar of cash. And a dollar of cash invested in your company is worth 30 cents. So even boards of directors, and even in America, even with stock options, are likely to stop building capital. And of course, at the peak, they get the reverse message. A dollar of cash is valued at two dollars, so let's invest in the, in the market. So I think there's some degree of reflexivity in this. So buying, as value investors, buying equities at deep replacement, uh, when, they, when they trade a deep replacement to the value of their assets, uh, and they stop building more in aggregate, is the time to buy. Uh, and of course, I think like most people in this room, I'm desperate for another opportunity to buy at that point. Uh, it's been a long wait. Uh, but that's why I think that these measures of value work, because they have impacts in the direct economy, the behavior of actors in the direct economy. They're not in isolation. They're not a thing for to be studied in academia. They have real impacts. So this little story about 4% inflation, uh, I think what I've done is I've looked at all the post-World War II periods when inflation has been low and rising. Uh, and I note that equities have done well. I'll show you five examples until inflation hits 4%. So the first time we hit 4% is obviously uh, the late 1960s, which was a great uh, surprise to many people. Uh, Dow Jones index falls from nearly 1,000 uh, down to uh, 700. Uh, America briefly controls inflation. And for those of you who, I and mean, the reason I study financial history is that it's a great uh, education, not just in finance, but a great education in politics, a great in education in philosophy. Uh, for those of you who want to know or who, or who don't remember how America controls inflation briefly in the mid-1970s, it's a Republican Party which introduces price controls and credit controls. That's the Republican Party, price controls and credit controls. These are the things that can happen uh, in the real world. And America had a commissioner for prices. There was an individual, if you were a corporation and you wanted to raise your prices above a certain level, you had to seek permission from the commissioner of prices. So is there anybody in this room who knows who was the commissioner for prices? Okay, well his name was Donald Rumsfeld. His first major job in office was to stop US corporations raising their prices. I think I would call that an unknown unknown based on your responses. Uh, so as you see, they lose control of inflation, the stock market comes down. Uh, so in 1987, not often remarked upon, but once again inflation goes through 4%. The stock market comes down. Uh, 2000, the inflation did not get to 4%, but got close to 4%. The stock market comes down. Uh, 2007, inflation gets to 4%. The stock market comes down. Now, it's clearly, there's no iron law. There's no rule in here. Uh, but what I'm going to suggest to you is the reason that this works, so the reason that you should be worried about 4% and not worried about levels of rising levels of inflation below that, 
is this is when the Fred ceases to be quiescent. Uh, quiescent is a wonderful word. I only know one man on the planet who ever used the word quiescent, and his name is Alan Greenspan. Uh, it was one of those words that he used to say when he didn't want anybody to understand what the hell he was talking about. So when inflation is quiescent, low but rising, the Fed is pretty relaxed. And I'm going to argue that it, there's something around 4%, and it's a rule of thumb that the Fed is not relaxed. So back to Gordon's dividend discount model. Suddenly, we begin to worry that that discount rate, which we thought was permanently locked in at a lower level, is going to be rising. And I think the Fed, uh, if you are an inflationist, I think the Fed will be very, very slow off the ball as inflation rises towards 4%, and the equity market uh, will probably go up. Why do I say it's all about the Fed and not about the level of inflation itself? Uh, it's because I used to live in a country called Hong Kong. And Hong Kong imports U.S. nominal rates, but does not import U.S. inflation. So the two are often and regularly completely out of step with each other. Uh, and living there, what I note is that if inflation goes to 4, 5, 6, and 7%, most likely equity prices are going up. They're not coming down. And therefore, what is the difference between uh, Hong Kong and the United States? There is no independent central banker attacking that level of inflation. And that level of inflation, in the absence of an active central bank, is actually very positive for equities. Clearly, you've got negative rates, higher negative rates, more negative rates, tends to be good. So I, based on my experience in Hong Kong, I believe that the 4% number uh, is important for equities simply because of the reaction it does provoke from the Fed. And if it clearly didn't provoke a reaction from the Fed, then I think we could question whether it would work. If the Fed wanted 6% inflation and did absolutely nothing about it, I would question whether actually even 6% inflation would bring down equities. Uh, but historically, they've been pretty worried when it gets to four, and we have to keep an eye on them to make sure that they remain equally worried uh, going forward at 4% inflation. So CAPE is 27 times, but I think it can go higher. Uh, US corporate profit margins as a percentage of GDP, uh, uh, GDP you'll see they're at an all-time high. I often present on this and people say, well, we think they can go higher. Well, yes, that's, of course they can go higher. But this is a, a sector of American society which is taking wealth, a very high percentage of the country's wealth, from creditors, very low interest rates, from the government, because actually the tax take on corporations is incredibly low. If we look back historically, particularly the periods when government debt was high, it's very low, and from labor. So people say to me, well, we know you think it's going to mean revert, because it always has been reverted, uh, but could you give us a situation in which this stays permanently higher? Uh, and after a few minutes of contemplation, I thought, yes, there is one situation in which the American corporate profit margins can go higher, and it's called the reintroduction of slavery. Uh, but short of the reintroduction of slavery, uh, this is a sociological model. I think people forget that. The amount of profits a corporate can take from a society is a sociological function. It isn't an economic function. And America has had revolts against this in the past. Once again, uh, beginning with Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson wasn't very big on big corporations, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt wasn't very big on big corporations either. So America is a free market, but it's a free market where at least three presidents have actively sought to bring down corporate profits as part of their uh, uh, policy. Uh, there's an easy way to be a free marketeer and also anti-corporate profits. Just put the word big in front of it. In America, if you really want to attack something, you put the word big in front of it. And I'm convinced if you ever used the word big charity, Americans would be against big charity. So as soon as you see a president putting the word big in front of anything, you know it's in trouble. So expect big companies. Everyone will be very much in favor of small companies, but just the big companies uh, that will be against. So if it's a sociological model, it has been mean reverting since 1929. Uh, I believe it will do so again. Uh, if you ask me what's the most likely trigger for that, it's taxes. It's not labor. Uh, it's not uh, nominal interest rates. I think it's most likely to be taxes. The corporation, and, and I realize people will start throwing things now, is grossly undertaxed. Uh, within GDP relative to the levels of government debt. Last time government debt to GDP was this high, the corporate tax take in America was about 9% of GDP, and it's currently about 3% of GDP. So I don't expect everybody in this, uh, this is not about me being having an opinion on what should happen, it's a forecast on what will happen. Uh, and the bit of society, I think, most likely to get active in taking corporate profits away is likely to be uh, the government, not necessarily through changing the tax rate, but just being more effective in the tax take. Uh, I'm going to do just a few more minutes on this issue of uh, uh, deflation, which is the future. Uh, so I'm just going to leave you with a few ideas on this, uh, because it's a big subject and it will take 45 minutes or longer. Uh, 
to talk about. So how can you have deflation in a fiat currency system? Uh, intuitively, it seems wrong. Mr. Bernanke went to great lengths in a famous speech in November uh, 2002 to tell us why it couldn't happen. So here are the reasons why Mr. Bernanke is wrong. Not every country in the world is, Amer is like America. There are countries out there which do not control their own monetary policy, which cannot print money at random. And those countries are anybody who links their currency to another. If you have your currency and you have an exchange rate policy linked to somebody else, you are not in control of the printing press. If you were to randomly start cranking that printing press up, that link to the other currency uh, would not survive. So when you have that link to another currency, you're not in control. Now that's a very large percentage of the world. Not necessarily with a declared fixed rate, but with a degree of massive intervention. And when you're intervening, you don't control. Now if inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, and there are central bankers out there who can't turn on the printing press, then we don't necessarily live in a world where you can always generate inflation. Now for me, of course, the big one is, is China. China, because it's such a big economy, has this link, devalued in 1994. And since 1994, it's done something which has never been done in human history. It's run a surplus on its current account and a surplus on its capital account at the same time since 1994. First time ever. Certainly for a large economy. Maybe some of the smaller city states have managed to achieve it, but they have achieved that. Now, the balance of payments, the clue is in the title. It's supposed to balance unless you intervene in the exchange rate. They intervene, they produce two surpluses. Does anybody really believe we're going to live for two more decades with China producing two surpluses? Because if you don't, China isn't going to be able to produce as much money with a stable exchange rate and grow as fast going forward. And that's where we've got to. We've got to a situation, uh, the last quarterly data, where China ran a surplus on its current account, but a significant deficit on its capital account. It doesn't run two surpluses, and therefore it can't have a stable exchange rate and print as much money going forward. And I can show you charts for 35 emerging markets, and what you see is all their foreign exchange reserves are coming down. In other words, that period where they all ran large surpluses had a stable exchange rate and printed money is coming down. So briefly, then, I have two options, devalue or, def or devalue or deflate. Stay with a fixed exchange rate, bring your internal prices down, become competitive to offset that deterioration in your external accounts, or simply devalue the currency. Both are deflationary for us, uh, and that's my key point. Whichever way they proceed, at least in the short run, both are deflationary for us. For the US dollar pricing, both are deflationary. In the long run, of course, if China says we don't care about the level of the exchange rate, print a lot of money, grow at 30%, then everything is absolutely fine. We will get to inflation eventually. But the initial change of this period of either deflation or devaluation is inherently, uh, deva uh, is inherently uh, deflationary. If we're standing here in 10 years and the world is awash with inflation, I have one forecast, that inflation will not come from the United States. It will come from China. It will come from a 30% growth in nominal GDP in China, which may be 5% in real terms, but will be very high in nominal terms. We will get back to a world flowing with inflation, but it's more likely to come from China uh, than the United States. And finally, on the deflation point, and this is where I'll finish, uh, it's just this demographic trends. If inflation is everywhere and at all times a monetary phenomenon, then we have to create money. Money is created not by the central bankers. Money is created by commercial bankers, the central bankers hold the reins, and in holding those reins, they try to drive that team of horses called the commercial bankers into a world where they create credit and money. And if they fail, then they fail to create money. And I think the failure today is a demographic function. Uh, the dominant credit on the books of commercial bankers are mortgages, and those mortgages are held by the baby boom generation primarily. Remember, the last baby boomer just turned 50. When you talk about baby boomers, people seem to think they're all 65 plus. They're not, they're 69 to 50. And it's a generation which is de-gearing, because if you don't retire your debt, you don't retire. This is a demographic function. It's not about interest rates or the cost of interest, it's a sociological demographic function. And that's a hell of a headwind for the banks to be growing their loan books into when you have a whole generation uh, de-gearing and retiring debt. So our inability to create a lot of money in the baby boom generation is not just uh, is not just a U.S. phenomenon, it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's going to be one at the emerging market level, where they're being forced into a situation of deflation or defaulting. America is now growing, but it's not growing with larger current account deficits. So those people linked to the dollar are not getting larger external surpluses. So they've got that choice. And internally, 
uh, we're not going to get strong bank credit and money growth. Uh, now, I could be wrong in all of that, and particularly as someone said to me when I was doing this presentation on the baby boom generation before, they said, nobody ever got rich underestimating the greed and stupidity of the baby boom generation. Uh, and that has been true to date, and we will see whether that continues to be true. So I think when you see any piece of data coming out of the United States, look at it in relation to the dem demography. These things play out slowly, but I think you'll see in a different context. So I think it's potentially a deflationary event coming. Equity prices are coming down, uh, and you'll get a cheap opportunity to buy. Uh, I'm conscious that there's now seven minutes left, I think, for, for Q&A. So I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> We have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so, what are the students with the mics? Uh, any questions, please? Uh, don't be afraid to ask. And uh, you can ask more questions later on, I guess, at the breaks uh, to Russell. What are the students over there? This lady over there. Have you heard up? Questions with respect to uh, market valuations. If you look at the last five years, it was a huge underperformance of value versus growth. If you just judge by, um, you know, commonly avail available indices. So, um, can you remember, like, if going back in history, if you can remember any similar? Uh, periods in time where value underperformed by such a dramatic uh, magnitude and uh, how long can it last? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so we start with a nice easy question. I mean, the first one is obviously yes, there's been lots of periods when this has happened before, not that long ago. The late 1990s was a classic example uh, of where it happened before. As to, how long, as to how long it can last, no, I can't give you an answer to that question. Uh, but what I can give you is this, is this framework. Uh, which suggests when uh, high equity valuations, uh, what, what catalysts there are to snuff out high equity valuations, and that is when value comes into it. So and that is when value will outperform growth. So as we sit here today, my answer to the question is this. If America grows with inflation rising but below 4%, then I think growth will continue to outperform value. Uh, but if it goes through 4% or we get deflation, then I think value will outperform growth. Uh, that's a very simplistic answer to a question which is the most complicated question potentially in, in finance. That's why you know, I've, I've done this presentation. I think those are key catalysts. Uh, what do I look at every, every morning to give me some idea whether, what sort of world we're heading into? Uh, basically, uh, I think it's four indicators. I look at the, the spread on BAA corporate bonds in America. The, the current American uh, growth market is, is a lot of it's driven by excessive corporate cash flow plowed back into equities. And I believe that spread is, a, is one of the ways that the market forecasts corporate cash flow. And if that spread starts to blow up, it's telling you that corporate cash flow is coming down and the premium for growth uh, is going to come down because there's less cash to be plowed back in. I look at the tips market and what it's signaling for inflation or deflation. And based on the presentation I've given you, if it begins to price in deflation, I think equities come down and value will be better than growth. Uh, I look at the copper price, which is much more of a global thing now than a United States thing, but historically, the copper has been a good indicator of these things. So I think, uh, and I haven't done enough work on it clearly in the context of the value growth debate, but I think the value, this whole valuation thing does tie into that, uh, those key indicators, uh, and to the extent that uh, they change every day, I'd keep an eye on those three as to when this rolls over backed uh, pro-value. Pro uh, and, and away from growth. Even for the from academic studies, uh, value does not beat growth every year. Sometimes take three, four years, but it's on average, so you've got to be patient. Okay, next question. Uh, over there. Hi, Ross. Um, so I just had, uh, to, well, I wanted to know if you have any opinion on, A, uh, the problem that we have in Japan right now, in terms of what they are doing in terms of QE, and B, in terms of demographics of, um, well, China becoming older, and Americans, as in, you know, the proportion of people becoming older, and what effect that would have on 
either inflation or deflation. Yeah, okay. I mean, once again, these are 45-minute answers. Really, These are very complicated questions. But just briefly on Japan, the demographics are key for Japan now. Japan is liquidating its savings. So this will be the first. They're ahead. They're not the baby boom generation. They're not 50. Debt. They're not accumulating savings and paying back debt. They're liquidating savings. They've just turned into that. That changes the world. Uh, and I mean that very strongly. It's said that Japan's main benefit is that it owns most of its own government debt. Its people own its government debt. That will prove to be its greatest weakness. Because in a situation where they dissave, the only net buyer now for the JGB is the central bank. Uh, and then once again, extreme statements in brief periods. Uh, but that is a situation that Japan is rapidly finding itself in. Uh, the, not, only is it the, not only will the central bank have to fly it by the flow of government debt, they run a big deficit, but they'll also have to buy a liquidated stock of that debt. And the more that they can convince the investors of Japan that the future has some inflation in it, the more the stock of the government debt the central bank will have to, it's a very vicious circle. It's happened before. Uh, and for those of you who want to read about it, there's an excellent book called Inflation and Monetary Regimes by Peter Bernholtz. Uh, and the answer is the exchange rate collapses. Uh, that is the most predictable thing that happens when you find yourself in that situation. America is not in that situation. As we've seen, America has stopped quantitative easing. There are other people who can buy its government debt. It is a large saving system which isn't full of government debt. So in Japan, I think we're, we could talk at length about what it means for everything else, but I think the most predictable thing is the exchange rate has a long way to fall, and the repercussions are there for, for China. So the demographics of China are something we have to worry about in the long run, but there's many, many more things we need to worry about in the short run for China uh, before we need to worry about the demographics. And uh, clearly, a, a very weak yen would be one of them. A 160 yen is not a situation where any of us will be talking about Japan. Because a 160 yen, the implications on Japan will be pretty clear and obvious to all of us. People will be asking questions about China. So the key question on China, short term and medium term, is its exchange rate. How will it proceed with that? Uh, I think it has to move the exchange rate and it has to move lower. It's just a matter of when they come to that realization. And in terms of what we all do for a living every day, that's such a major decision that that swamps, it, swamps everything uh, for China. So demographics, I think, generally, we can fit the American sort of thing into most of Europe as well. It can be very tricky for the rest of the world, I think, to, to grow credit. Uh, and I should give you a solution, because I'm not some, and it's not going to be a Great Depression. There is an easy solution to this problem, and it's going to happen, and it's a political solution, and it's going to happen within three to four years. America will move all of its student debt to the government's balance sheet. One trillion dollars worth of student debt will go off the balance sheet of the students onto the balance sheet of the government, and I used to be a student. I know exactly what will happen if you took a trillion dollars of debt off the student population. They'll borrow a trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and if you want to get past this demographic bulge, well, it's this demographic block on the ability, inability to create bank credit and money, just see what happens if you move that trillion dollars. Now, that, the problem is that's a political decision. It's not monetary policy. So we can have inflation and growth again. Uh, but those are, you, know, you can see why the U.S. Congress is not going to take a decision like that. So I'm, I'm put up a demographic reason why we have deflation. But there are solutions to it. But they're pretty big political solutions. They're not monetary solutions. 